All right, uh, let's get started. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Henry Hanglu. I'm the executive director and curator of Center A, Vancouver International Center for Contemporary Asian Art. Uh, welcome uh, to the, um, the cyberspace uh, today. Um, and thank you for joining uh, us for uh, the last uh, program of um, our uh, 2022 uh, speaker series. Um, it's uh, it has been an extensive um, lineup of speakers, uh, guest lectures, uh, talks, and um, uh, online activities uh, throughout the entire 2022. Uh, so thank you so much for your support. And I have seen some uh, familiar faces in our attendee list. So uh, thank you uh, for coming. And um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we are situated on the unceded territories of Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples, on which we create, learn, and live. Unceded means that this land was never uh, surrounded, uh, relinquished, or handed over in any way. We recognize that the indigenous uh, peoples who have been dispossessed from the homelands and territories upon which an institution was built and currently occupies and operates in. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to uh, recognize the city and country's longer history predating confederation, one where indigenous peoples have lived since time immemorial. And, and I encourage you to reflect on the history of the land that you are watching or streaming this from, and then also the land's caretakers. Located in Vancouver's Chinatown Center, I also acknowledge and recognize the complex and multi-layered experiences of the individuals and communities who have lived, built, and contributed to the vibrancy of this historic neighborhood and those who continue to do so today. Um, we, um, in uh, the, our previous uh, program, uh, as part of the speaker series with um, uh, Suvan Kem, uh, Toma Kalsa, uh, Toma Wansa, and uh, we have extended uh, the speaker series uh, with one final event, which is today, um, a talk with um, Sunil Gupta and Tom Xu, and um, uh, the talk would be, uh, uh, would take the format uh, of, uh, the format of the, the program will be uh, presentations from uh, both artists, and then we will have um, Q&A. Uh, afterwards, and feel free to put in any questions in the through the Q and A function at the bottom of your um, Zoom. And um, um, we are, and uh, personally, I also am interested in sort of there is these intersections and also continuity in both of uh, both artists' works. And then we're here to uh, explore and then to. Uh, delve into uh, the great practices of these two artists and also Tom would be um, <clears throat> also in a kind of like moderating kind of role uh, as well. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I would like to uh, introduce both artists. Uh, Sunil, uh, Sunil Gupta is a British Canadian citizen um, who lives in London, has been involved with independent photography. <clears throat> Excuse me as a critical practice for many years, focusing on race, migration, and queer issues. A retrospective was shown at the Photographer's Gallery London 2020 to 2021 and the Image Center Toronto. He's a professional fellow at UCA Farm. His latest book is We Were Here, Sexuality, Sexuality Photography, and Cultural Difference, Selected Writings by Sunil Gupta, Aperture New York 2022. And his current exhibitions include Sunil Gupta, Songs of Deliverance, Part 1 and Part 2, and the Homer Smith Hospital, London. His work is in many private uh, and public collections, including the Tokyo Museum of Photog Photography, the Philadelphia uh, Museum of Art, the Royal Ontario uh, Museum, Tate, and the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, his work is represented by Hales Gallery in New York and London, uh, Materia Gallery in Rome, and then the Stephen Boger uh, Gallery in Toronto, and also the Videra Art Gallery in New Delhi. 
Tom Xu is uh, an artist currently residing and working in uh, unceded Musqueam Silver Truth uh, in Squamish territories, also known as Vancouver. His practice focuses on uh, the observation of spaces and how bodies exist in them. He's using um, a 35 millimeter uh, camera, uh, Tom approaches his subjects from uh, odd angles, cropping out the larger scene to focus on. Uh, specific form, forms conveying uh, a gentle intimacy. His camera finds everyday mundane moments and interactions that are often overlooked and gives them a poetic and um, uh, expressive uh, uh, interpretation. His work has been exhibited at numerous galleries, including um, Libby Lushko Gallery, Center A. We actually <clears throat> There's a poster. <laughs> uh, it was my actually my first project as the trade back in 2019. And then the um, the Macaulay and Co. Fine Arts, Broad Arts Foundation, Yatek, Unipid Gallery, and also Gallery TBW in Toronto. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, to bring on uh, both artists and then uh, Sunil will uh, be the first to uh, to uh, to talk about his work and then give us a, the opportunity to delve into his practice and career. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Henry, for that introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak uh, this morning, this evening, and middle of the night for Tom. And <laughs> thank you all for being there. Uh, so, um, so I thought I would just try and give a, a brief, I'm trying to make it as brief as possible, uh, overview of, uh, what I thought was my practice over the last four or five decades. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on the eighties. They seem to be making, uh, there seem to be a great interest at the moment for various reasons. I'll discuss that. Uh, so. It's a little bit lengthy, so maybe I'll just launch into it straight away and uh, we can come back with the questions to uh, points of particular interest. Uh, I guess one thing I should say is that uh, although I'm quite far away from Vancouver and my relationship with Canada is with the East Coast, uh, I have uh, had opportunities and have come periodically starting way back in the 90s when Keith Wallace uh, brought my work to the Contemporary Art Gallery. And uh, I brought an exhibition also, a uh, curated exhibition to the Vancouver Art Gallery. Uh, so anyway, here's uh, the presentation. Uh, now I was gonna make this let me see. Okay, so what's a practice? Well, for me, it was photography, and then quite quickly was politics and uh, and gay that now become queer, and race that became black and is now not so black. The curating and the community, and of course, activism is behind everything. Uh, so this is how my photography began. I was self-taught. I was a student. Uh, in Montreal, I arrived from India at the end of the 60s, uh, went to Dawson, uh, discovered K Liberation there, went to what's now Concordia. Uh, K McGill started as a kind of student activist group, and I began to take pictures of what was going on. This is very early demonstrations. This is inside a workers' rally, May Day kind of parade, and uh, just to remind us that. For many of us in my generation, uh, what's now become gay pride really started in, in the heart of politics. Uh, and so my issue at the top of the screen and it initially was this representation of politics, the need to document it and the camera became this tool to go and take pictures of it. Then our group uh, at McGill had a newspaper. Uh, so immediately the pictures were published and then um, as a student amateur, I suddenly also then had an audience. Pictures appeared on the left, uh, the demo pictures on the right are kind of news pictures, uh, 
a gay bathhouse was set on fire in Montreal. Uh, people died in it. It was quite serious and all that. So I would run down with my camera and take pictures. Uh, that was my initiation into the world of photography. Uh, and then uh, I was very interested in photography as a hobby and to selfies, of course, uh, before there were selfies. Uh, I wasn't studying art or photography. I was in business school being a nice Asian boy. My choices were medicine, engineering or business. And so I figured business was the fastest way out of my parents' house. So I met another guy at Gay McGill, a, a graduate student though, so he finished before me. Uh, we got together. I was very young, about 20, I think. And uh, I decided he was the guy. So he went to uh, train in New York. He got a job with a bank and I followed him. Uh, and uh, it was there that uh, I made this transition from uh, just doing it as a hobby uh, because I ostensibly come to New York to enroll in an MBA. Parents will still be you know, involved with funding this. Uh, but it's in New York that I encountered this big world of photography, which I had never seen before. I'd only visited it from, from afar, but living there was quite different. We had none of this in Montreal. There were no photo galleries. There were very hardly any opportunities, but suddenly a lot of photo galleries, history of photography in the museums. I kind of, my self teaching became like incredibly, uh, uh, pervasive or an all-encompassing. So I ditched the MBA and enrolled at the new school and uh, uh, did photography classes. And this is what I used to produce. Uh, street pictures was what I was interested in. And Christopher Street, you know, our, the gay street uh, became my subject for a while. Uh, <clears throat> it was after Stonewall and before AIDS. So people were out and about and promenading and wanting to show themselves to see and be seen. I was doing the same. I was in my early 20s. So I was not documenting this as an anthropologist, but more like something tribal. It was my own tribe, so to speak. Uh, so then I followed the same person to London. He, his job was in London. Uh, I had to come clean with my parents, of course, who thought it was a terrible idea that I'd giving up business school that I was going to uh, to London, which they thought of as a backward place, going back east. They thought they'd come west to Canada was the west. Uh, so they thought was the whole thing was a step backwards. Anyway, so I, for better or worse, I came to London and then enrolled in art school, then had proper art training for five years. And one of my student projects was to try and get a show. So the exhibition side immediately kind of became important. And this was the show, very early 1980 this is. British color photography show, but the work is from Montreal. Uh, I made this there with a friend. You know, we were like young gay men who went out every night or every weekend uh, and met more or less the same people because Montreal is not a very big place. Uh, and we made work about them, other young gay guys like us. And then London was a little bit of a, uh, uh, setback because it was nothing like New York. Uh, it was very homophobic. The British police were busy arresting people. People were kind of in hiding. The bars closed at 10.30 in North America. In Canada, we went out at midnight, but here we were coming home at 11. And uh, I tried to do Christopher Street here, but it wasn't possible. So uh, I did get a few pictures. And then I, on the left is this, uh, I Sort of researched and photographed the largest LGBT voluntary organization as a way of getting to know London up close and through the photography here on the left is uh, what became of that work was a tape slide uh, and it's uh, it's now suddenly being resurrected as a video so it's doing the rounds at the moment for London Gay Switchboard. On the right is a uh, sort of random documentary picture I made. I began going to India in the, from 1980 onwards uh, to do documentary work of other kinds, but I thought I'll, I'd have a look at what's happening to the gay scene and uh, basically uh, found that there were people who said they were gay, but they didn't really want to be in the pictures. So uh, I, didn't, I didn't quite know how to go about it. 
So these two aren't necessarily gay. They were just two guys standing by the lake. Uh, and then this picture I made with a friend uh, who of course didn't want to be in the, in the uh, picture. So uh, I showed it to this newspaper, it's in the Guardian. Uh, they said it's a story about gays in India. So I quickly wrote one, this is 82. Uh, so that was my first attempt at writing in pictures uh, about my favorite subject uh, in the mainstream press, let's say. And then I came out of uh, grad school in 83 into a very postmodern, post-colonial world, uh, meaning we were guided very much by uh, people like Spivak and Edward Said around race and culture, and Omi Baba and so on. So instead of going to Cork Street and joining a commercial gallery, which is what my art training was trying to lead me towards, I went the other way and joined the town hall and didn't do commercial work and made pictures about politics for myself. And here some on the left is an advertising poster. They used my name because it was short and ethnic. And on the right is the kind of material they used to produce about rights of various kinds, LGBT rights, rights around race, etc. And um, at that point, uh, the Home Office said I could leave. So I back to Canada very briefly, uh, went to Toronto. They said, uh, you're much better off in London. You know, all the jobs in Toronto are taken by people who've been to art school in Toronto. So if I were you, I would stay where you, where you are. So I went back, even though me and the guy by then had split up. Uh, and so, which was a big shock to me. I didn't expect that to happen. So suddenly I was in London with no guy and no home and everything and sort of wondering what happened and began a project about couples. Uh, on the left is really the next guy that I met. And on the right is this couple series, 10 years on. And I just did that for myself, although I did have a brief exhibition moment. Uh, this is 85 or so, and it got a little bit of local coverage but not didn't really do much touring beyond that. And so I spent the eighties really going, spending the evenings, going to a lot of meetings about being gay, about being Asian, about being black, about this, that, or the other thing about AIDS and meeting people. And then we set up a gay black group. And you can see on the left, we defined black in the post-colonial way. It wasn't color. It was everybody who had been subjects of the British empire and excluded the Irish as well at one point. This group, of course, began to splinter and then it became a South Asian group at one point. On the right is one of the earliest LGBT shows that we did, photo shows in a funded space called Camera Work, which I helped to organize uh, with the woman on the left there. Um, and then the gay scene in London in the 80s was very white. So there was a racial problem inside the gay scene. So one suddenly was you were fighting multiple battles on multiple fronts as you I can, might be able to relate to yourselves. Uh, uh, you have a, people of color at home, you know, family is very homophobic, really hard to come out, etc. And then you're supposed to come out and what? Go to the gay scene, which is very white and very racist. So then, uh, in London, the response was then to have private parties for black gay men and uh, gay men of color. So this is one of those. But I have to say there was a very vibrant uh, kind of uh, critical scene around art and photography and homosexuality and race at that point. Uh, Homo cult was a group that produced these sort of little uh cards or posters or leaflets they would just hand them out all over the scene they were just free you pick them up uh testimony was a a show of three black women curated by a black woman all of whom were queer but none of them could say that at the time uh, uh, some of them have become very well known one of the curator was lobena hamid who's won a <clears throat> turner prize and one of the other people was ingrid pollard who's now uh, in th this year's Turner Prize nominee. 
So in the mid 80s, I went off to India again, this time with some little commission from a gallery to make work. So I decided to make work about this, about K-Men in India. I really was, became kind of a, a goal for me, you know, because uh, nobody in my art education was uh, said absolutely nothing about uh, non-European art and said nothing about gay men and said absolutely zero about Indian gay men. They seem to not exist. And I said, I don't know what to make work about. Everybody else is able to somehow make work about where they came from or whatever matters to them in that postmodern referential way. And I kind of couldn't, it seems. So then I thought I've got to make something that's about India and about gays. So I made this series Exiles. It's a sample of it here. So by now I ditched documentary photography and I'm using this constructed kind of practice. So the people are participants. You know, I, they, we've all come here together to take the picture. They're also my informants. So people were telling me things and I thought this series was, the situation was very complex. It was more complex than I could convey in literally in still pictures. So I added some text uh, and this text image phenomena was something that my generation was very much part of. It was part of that kind of 70s, slightly critical art practice that had uh, spilled over into the 80s. So this was in a, the photographer's gallery in central London and it passed without any comment. I think people just looked at it and thought, oh, well, there's a bunch of Indians in color and that was it. And then much later in 99, like 15 years later, it was resurrected and shown in a South Asian neighborhood in West London. And there it caused a huge fuss. Gallery got shut down. People accused it of all kinds of things. They said I was lying. There was no such thing as gay men in India, et cetera, et cetera. This is 1999. So meanwhile, of course, the 80s AIDS had arrived. The British tabloid press was very negative and hostile. Here they are doing their best. Uh, uh, and it was everywhere, the media. But at the same time uh, in London around photography and race, there was a little bit of a rumbling. Uh, we were lobbying for funding from the funding bodies and they produced a report finally around African, Caribbean, South Asian photography. This became the uh, racial, groupings that became black arts, what became known as black arts there. And these sort of programs appeared around, such as this, which was around the black experience in the mid eighties funded by the town hall. That's what that GLC is. Uh, so just very quickly, this is what we I mean by the black arts movement. It was in the eighties in Britain. So it's post-colonial, it's not color, it's funded locally. And then a, a number of cultural companies were formed, Sankofa, Black Audio, et cetera, and film, there was Black Theater, Asian Theater. A bunch of us started Autograph, which was a photo organization. Autograph came out of this exhibition. It was uh, 86 in the Brixton Art Gallery. We had a very early Black photo show. 10 people took, had 10 pictures each of their Black experience. This was my contribution. <clears throat> Autograph got started off as a funded arts council organization as a lobbying group for uh, those groups of people, African, Caribbean, and South Asian. Uh, meanwhile, like still in the 80s, the hostile British government came up with this clause 28, uh, which made it uh, illegal for our town halls to fund any kind of cultural activity that supported the idea of homosexuality as what they called a pretended family relationship. So there were a lot of demos. I photographed them for papers like that. It also led to some artwork. I'm sorry, it's a little bit hidden on this screen now, but so there was a portrait of a couple and a poem and, uh, and bits of the demo pictures on the side. So this is called pretended family relationships. So it began like this, this is a pretend family uh, standing in front of our houses of parliament and we're not sure if they if they want us or not anyway so the uh, the 80s also meant that uh, we had to organize because there were no uh, curators coming our way uh, 
So I began to answer jobs. I answered this job to organ research this exhibition for a, a city art museum up in Leeds, which was Fable Territories about uh, Asia, South Asian photography in the UK. And then I followed that up. This was an idea I took to this gallery to make a uh, comparable exhibition coming out of India itself directly. Uh, I thought I'd, we'd have a book of the 80s went by with no publication. So there's hardly any record of what happened. Uh, but I bumped into a publisher one day and she, she agreed that she would publish a book for this. So we were able to have a book for this project. Uh, Meanwhile, Autograph started off its own little publishing and shows. Uh, that was the first show, Auto Portraits in 1990. And we made little newsletters on a desktop publishing just as a way of having a discourse in print. And of course, nobody else was talking about anything like this. You can, you can imagine none of the mainstream art or photo magazines or writers or curators were at all doing anything uh, around race and culture then. And Ecstatic Antibodies was a show about AIDS that I co-organized with Tessa Boffin, who I met at a meeting about AIDS. So one of these meetings that I used to go to, I think when I was younger, um, I was uh, poor. I've basically been relatively poor most of the time. And going to meetings was a cheaper way of having a night out and possibly meeting people. So that's how I did it, not by going out on the scene and spending a lot of money drinking. It was much cheaper going to a meeting and bumping into people there. However, so ecstatic antibodies became this very British response to HIV and AIDS in the UK. So this was an even bigger book. Book now meant that we could have writers. So a third of the book was the writers writing essays as well as the artists. Uh, and of course I made photo work uh, through my network of local authorities and trade unions and people working with race and so on. Uh, around AIDS on the left, on the right is just, uh, I want you to just make a nod to the big debate at the time. One of the several big debates was around pornography and censorship, where feminist women and feminists came in kind of disagreed around porn. Uh, this is a big moment as well. Uh, and then in the, by the early 90s, I moved into, uh, I left Autograph uh, uh, and got involved with full-time curating, but uh, to help a larger company get off the ground called Innova. So, uh, so for the next several years, it became my main uh, income generating occupation. I stopped being camera for hire and I did curatorial projects. Uh, this was the first one. Uh, then in between, I made work of my own, again, responding to whatever was happening. This was the early 90s. Britain was going into Europe, the opposite of Brexit. Uh, us migrants here, especially from the Commonwealth, were anxious about our status, what would happen to us in Europe, which didn't have a Commonwealth. Uh, so I went to Berlin. Uh, with, and took a whole bunch of snaps and scanned them with the new basic Apple scanners that had come out, very low res. I was very excited and it broke my dependency on modernist photography and full frame, single frame, you know, negative, full frame negative print kind of photography. And I found my name in Berlin and it's a soap powder. So of having spelt it constantly in, uh, in the West, suddenly, uh, everybody had heard of it. They all knew my name. It was rather nice. So uh, anyway, so this is the work that uh, came to Vancouver, actually, uh, some, some point in the early 90s uh, through Keith and the uh, Contemporary Art Gallery. Uh, and which from there it went on to the Havana Biennial in 95. There it is behind these guys. Uh, Havana was very interesting. Uh, at the opening, I met these three who looked like they weren't artists, but possibly might be local gay men who found an opening where they could get free booze. So, of course, I befriended them. Uh, and then we all kind of hung out for a week. I also met lots of uh, artists of color from different parts of the world. Uh, so that was very exciting to be kind of, you uh, know, in, in a majority. And you realize then that 
if you look at the whole world, then you know, obviously Asians and Africans, etc., are in the majority. Uh, so uh, yeah, these are some shows that I did, uh, big ones. So transitions was about bringing South Africa out of isolation uh, to the UK. This thing called New Worlds was called the New Republics. It was looking at landscape art from Australia, Canada, and South Africa, and this it opened at the Canadian uh, at Canada House here in London, and the um, the High Commissioner of Canada, who was the Royalist or something, said we could possibly have the word Republic on his building, so we had to have a name change just for London. And then in the mid nineties, the middle of all this excitement and work and research and whatnot, uh, I got HIV. So uh, that was ninety five. And then I thought, well, well, gay and Asian and black and everything. I think I'm not going to be HIV as well. That would be like too many things. And uh, uh, I'd had this separatist experience in the eighties, and I thought if I'm going to add HIV to the mix. I'll end up having nobody I can speak with. <laughs> so that I let let it go for a while. So it wasn't until ninety nine when I was actually not well, and uh, I got a commission from the very same autograph. He gave me a thousand pounds to do something. So what I did was leave the computer behind and go back to analog and into the dark room and made this body of work, which was looking at my. It's called from here to eternity, looking at my HIV positive body in the various degrees of illness. And on the right-hand side are facades of gay nightclubs in my neighborhood in South London, which had slowly, all of them had converted into sex clubs. Uh, by the way, you know, HIV had the opposite effect in the UK compared to North America, sort of shutting everything down. Uh, England went the other way. When I first came, it was very conservative. You couldn't hold hands or anything. And then in the middle of eight, suddenly you, had, you were dropping your clothes at the door and everyone, it was like a big, uh, basically, you went in that space and it was like a sex club uh, and nobody said anything. The, the hostile tabloids, everybody was very quiet about this. And so, uh, yeah, it's, then by the 2000s, uh, another critical moment kind of happened. Uh, I was realized that my black arts uh, uh, work would, had kind of uh, peaked and was not really on the wane, been replaced by the white YBAs. And uh, I was about to turn 50 and I really didn't know what to do next. Uh, and uh, I'd been ill and I'd, stopped doing as much work and didn't help my finances. And uh, anyway, out of the blue, I got this uh, art fellowship for a few, couple of years to look at, to make a project. So I went to look at Canada, India and all that and made this project on Homeland, the places that have been home to me uh, through an HIV lens. And that's what, and then after that, I. Oh, there's Homelands. Uh, it was at the MCP, which is now, of course, part of the National Gallery. Uh, and so after this, by 2005, then I was, I decided I just, I'd moved to India. Uh, not because I was homesick for India, but because I'd had a show in India in 2004. And that guy in the picture, he seduced me because you know, by then I'd been single for about seven years. Uh, HIV meant also that I ended up being very single for very long. Uh, and so I used to avoid uh, having too much sex in India because I'd had not great experiences. Uh, anyway, so uh, partly because of him, partly because I thought, oh, I'm 50, I may as well move to India. I didn't quite know what to do here anymore. Uh, and I moved and then he was, no longer interested, but by then I have, I was there. So I thought, well, now that I'm here, I'd better stay because I've had this big party, invited everyone, said, you're all a bunch of racists. I'm going home. You can keep England to yourselves. I'm leaving. I'm going back to, to my home. So there I am. So by 2008, I'd been adopted by a local young 
queer activist group uh, coming out of the local universities there. And uh, they wanted me to join. And then I was able to relive my own youth in a way. Uh, so that was great. Uh, so we had uh, all kinds of events, including festivals and so on. There they are. This is our festival. Uh, and uh, for a country that never mentioned gay, you know, like a couple of years before this, it was pretty amazing to see all this happening. And then anybody who came by, we'd ask them to speak. You know, um, people like Richard Fung from Toronto would come by and then they would speak. Uh, we had movies, we had photography, we had everything, performances, poetry, and so on. This was from our photo exhibition on the left. There's actually a picture by Zaneli Maholi. I'd met her somewhere and she said she'd send us pictures, she did. And on the right are some local people that sent us some pictures. The idea of the festival, you know, was to create opportunities for people to make film and photography about being Indian and gay. Because on the whole, we were getting too much uh, input from the outside and, and we found there was nothing indigenous, nothing local from inside India. And I think by having an opportunity to make something, then people responded. I have to say now five years of this, now we have an archive of 500 lesbian and gay Indian pictures, which we wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, anyway, I did my own work, uh, the portraits again, but this time they're now facing the camera and all these young people are out and they want to be named and all that. Uh, uh, these portraits have been here and there. Uh, including being a poster for modern India, which was, again, quite a big step. The media got very positive. Uh, the groups initiated the, uh, of the first Pride March in Delhi in 2008, I think, yeah. And then, then by 2009, it was legalized. Uh, and then I had a studio where I made some more work based on, in this case, on the pre-Raphaelites. <laughs> and so the Indian media just got much more sympathetic. Uh, it had been very anti and it just suddenly changed its tune, uh, which just helped a lot to change the law. Uh, I found a gallery because uh, there was no arts council. That was a problem. There was no funding for the arts. That's something I wasn't used to. Everything was commercial, you know, in India. So, so in the end, I found a commercial gallery, very sympathetic and they made a monograph, we could call it queer, something that was, again, I was surprised they could do that in 2010. Uh, Keith Wallace again uh, agreed to write the, the essay for it. It was very kind of him. Uh, uh, this is, um, and then being in India, I suddenly found myself in a kind of, uh, main in a kind of slipstream of visiting curators. So I think the art world had discovered, I don't know, South Africa, then China, and then India was next. So by the late 2000s, they were coming by. You just have to be in, in India in the winter and then they, they come by. So and they, making all these studio visits. And I would say, but I can see you in London. They said, no, 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 we have, they have to find you there. You have to be authentic Indian in India, right? They have to find you in India. They want to find you here in the West. Uh, so anyway, one of these led to this uh, commission at the Pompidou Center. I think it was uh, ambitious work for me. I had a crew in a production company and I made a set of stills that were, the stills were a fake movie. Uh, it was uh, set in a gay bathhouse. Um, and then, those pictures uh, got me in a little bit of trouble in Delhi. Uh, somebody called the cops, etc. Uh, so basically in, by 2012, uh, I left to come back to London, but this time with somebody, I'd met a guy in Delhi. Uh, and to get back to London, we got married in Toronto. And it's hidden here, I'm really sorry, uh, on my screen anyway. Uh, and then we, jointly got a commission to make a book about queer communities in New Delhi. So that was, we went back based from here to make this book. Uh, and then I've gotten involved with my archive. I now have this big vast collection of pictures. So they, uh, I found a sympathetic publisher 
they began to publish them. This was the first one in 2018. This did really well. Uh, uh, and then I found a commercial gallery in London in, that's also in New York, and they made a show of the pictures. Uh, uh, and then for, again, from the archives, the, the earlier period in Montreal that was an exhibition at Stephen Bourgeois. Uh, the Delhi pictures also became an art exhibition, which was then called Descent and Desire. It started in Houston, toured to the Kochi Biennial in 2018. Here we are speaking. Uh, the, the couple's pictures also became a book. Uh, And then in 2020, this book came out. It was uh, uh, went with the retrospective that happened uh, between Toronto and London. Uh, there was not enough budget to make like a tome, which was fine. And so uh, the curator was Mark Seeley from Autograph and I, we decided that we'd rather make a very different kind of book. Uh, all the work in the show has been published in some form or another elsewhere most of it. So uh, we made a book of the ephemera. So over, I've been collecting all these bits and pieces over the years. And it's a book of the context of the pictures. So it's like, uh, it's what was happening, partly personal, my life, getting uh, boyfriends, no boyfriends, family, etc. but also shows and funding and funders and people and stuff like that. Uh, Uh, that's the, just that was just this year from Toronto, uh, uh, and that's from Toronto. That's the friends and family from Montreal seventies on the wall. They, it was, that was a really good show. I was really happy with what how they presented it there. And the latest book was again from the archives about London in eighty two, the streets. And then this summer, uh, my partner and I made life-size portraits of LGBT asylum seekers to the UK for the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. And finally, uh, this book just came out. This is a collection of all kinds of little writings I've been doing since the eighties, uh, you know, reviews and uh, essays about other people's work, uh, that kind of thing, um, and a bit of my PhD thesis at the end. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, I've, uh, I suppose I'm going to say that it's been uh, quite a ride, but uh, I feel like I've ended up in a good place at 69. I can't complain. I'm still around, so that's, uh, I'm happy about that. So, Henry, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Sunil. What a career. And then, uh, yeah. Such a, thank you for the kind of overview of some of these key moments of um, your practice. And uh, also beyond just uh, a, a, photograph, a, a photo practice, but also through uh, dissemination of information and also um, activist work. So uh, they really uh, they they really came together, and then as um, uh, uh, advocacy and also um, these like um, uh, closer examination of the issues as well. Uh, so we I will hand the mic. Uh, to Tom. Uh, Tom will also talk about uh, some of his works and then uh, and and then we will uh, we, we will do uh, we'll have like a conversation after that. Thank you Sunil for this that wonderful talk and thank you Henry for the introduction. Um, how do I talk that? <laughs> um, let me share my screen. Uh, 
Um, I I will start to begin by an image an image that um was part of Century A that Henry and I curated in the beginning. Um, it's basically how I kind of navigate um, my queer life, I guess. There was no, growing up, there was no, nothing really, my parents didn't really like teach me anything. We, it was also kind of a lot of research on my own. So I start by this image of uh, cleaning a sex toy um, that I had to YouTube to know how to deal with these things. Um, so I am terribly nervous, by the way. Um, I, I grew up in, and I'm currently in Taiwan right now. I grew up in Shenzhou. Um, so right now I'm kind of back home, re-navigating where I come from. Um, I, uh, during 2018, 2017, I think more of my work became more and more queer like I started noticing the intimacy that is around my friends and everything and I was heavily fascinated by how int int intimacy works I guess and I was just curious of how um the touch and feels and everything and was just wanting how to, how to navigate that um so most of my work have a slight like tendency to have um that can go towards like other meanings I guess that can be a bit more sexualized or not sexualized but it's it occurs in the everyday and in some ways I think seeing that it feels like there's like queer things everywhere and today um so And yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll just go through some of the images and, um, and explain on the way. For example, like going on a hike with, with a banana between my shorts. Um, for some reason, that reminds me of something else. And also observing friends and couples that have tendency to have intimacy with each, with each other. I was always kind of curious how that works, I guess. Um, And just how the body it, and the relates to the everyday that surrounds us. And um, most of these images are 35 millimeters because um, I like how fast it can catch the mid actions of things. But also the gentle and how the camera is able to freeze a certain moment and how it's, it kind of changes um I guess the meaning doesn't really changes but then it, it's something uh, tender to look back on and a lot of these are just I guess my a lot of the my subjects are just friends laying around so um at some level we've already become comfortable with each other so in some ways it's um just it, it's just some observation of how um, my friends kind of surround themselves, surround themselves with that. And um, and we would kind of go through like go on like sort of all sorts of adventures and stuff like that to look for spaces that we could just I guess flock flock around. And um, and events that we would go to, we sometimes would dress up and go out and stuff like that. So this was during 2018 and such. And then I went to I went to my car, and during school it was during um, I was taking mostly portraits. Um, so this is these are images from 2018. I, I've already graduated school, but then I portraits have always been something that I, I continue to do. Um, so these are images of um, the House of Kosovias, which is a Vogue uh, a family in here, uh, in there in Vancouver. And I was taking their portraits as a uh, house together in 2018. 
and this is my friend Ralph. He kind of throws the ball, the ball, the Vogue ball scenes called Van Vogue Jam in Vancouver. And these are some more of their family or house. And I guess like learning, like going through learning photography was going out was part of um, learning how to navigate photography, I guess. Because in some ways it's kind of like you remember what happened the night before, but at the same time you also have the chance to also meet a bunch of other people and such. So in some ways that helped, that helped me build some courage to um, engage with people and meet people and kind of keep that connection going in some ways. And also to teach me like not to be so much afraid of like being queer and such. And then in 20, Eight, uh, 2015 and 2019, I went on, um, I did the AIDS life cycle, which is a bike ride from San Francisco to LA. Um, the first time I did the ride, I think I was more curious about, um, I guess, like the challenge of it. But then going the second time I, after I did the ride, it was, I just had such a good experience and learning about um, the community and, and AIDS and everything. So I went on with the ride again, and um, this is one of me and my friend, we were halfway to LA. And this is another day that it was a red dress day. So everyone during that day would wear red, would wear red. And there's this hill that you would bike up on. And from a far distance, you would see kind of like the hill made a ribbon shape as the bikers would go up the hill. So at some point it was a, a a symbol of like the red ribbon. And then afterwards, usually um, we ride into LA Pride. So I was there to enjoy the, the end of the ride. They kind of cheer you on at the end, which is kind of pretty nice. And then I was also taking friends of um, couples and such. It was interesting to hear Sunil mention couple because for me, it was it's, a, it's interesting to um, observe, not observe how couples work, but more like learning, learning how um, to be a couple, I guess, because growing up, I was never really taught that, I guess, well, who else, I guess, but um, for me, it was like, through photography, I think it was able to engage like that. And some of more portraits of um, my friends around. And this is my friend Nargis. We actually went to high school together and we didn't know that until we kind of started getting to know each other after these portraits. And I, yeah, like I said earlier, growing up in Emily Carr, it was mostly portraits. So portraits has never really left me, but after Emily Carr, I was kind of, after school, I was more engaging, doing more street stuff outside. But I'll go through some of these portraits that I've made. Um, and they're all like friends that I hold close connection with. And at some point I started inserting myself in the images because I feel like, um, for some reason, I, I guess it was, it was, maybe it was just like for my own or for our own kind of personal thing, but it was important, I guess, some, at some level to see myself in the image for, in some images, so the mirror acts as like a reflection of uh, how like I am there, but here I am actually there. And then we would, yeah. And then I, I, I did a whole bunch of, not a whole bunch, but I started doing a bunch of just, I guess, self portraits. Um. And sometimes my friend and I would set up and like, we would dress up and kind of pretend, not pretend, but just like enjoy ourselves and stuff like that. A lot of times it was during Halloween. So 
And this is another friend of mine, um, Venus. She's there, a drag performer, and also um, a really good friend. So during a couple, um, during the, the couple of years, I would always photograph the same people because I think, um, I guess like time also plays a role in photography of how things can change, whether it be the relationship or whether it be, I guess like time catches, I guess we all age at some point and it's interesting to see how that progresses. And um, I'll, I've included some of these install shots of the shows I've done. This was a show at Borough Talk Foundation and this was the first time I was experimenting with how to install images and as playing with a space. In the back room, it's kind of a, like a dark room and the front room, it was like a bright room. So I kind of was playing with light and dark and how that works with photography. So you could see half the space is brightly lit and the other one is kind of like my thoughts on photography, I guess. There was a mechanism outside the space that allow you to kind of um, turn the lights on as you switch the dial. And I was kind of interested in that, how like of a shock of how some things, some things, like how a shock, like the experience of photography can be. I'm not sure, maybe it's just like on my end, but like that's what I was thinking back then, I guess. And another recent show I did at the Lippi Leshkold Gallery um, that has a variety of different images that I was working on the past 10 years. And what was interesting, this show is called Around the Corner, um, curated by uh, Jen Jackson, Fenwell, and Christian Vestan. Um, how you walk into the show, the show is called Around the Corner. Um, and I made a corner in, in the middle of the room. You kind of have to walk around the corner in order to share secrets or see what's around the corner, which was an image of a really phallic um, uh, erection, I guess. And I think I, I, I placed the image right behind my, my grandmother over there because I thought there's something like, not hiding, but just like there is um, unsaid words that like sometimes she doesn't know I'm queer. Well, she doesn't know I'm queer, but like, um, but it's like behind her in some ways. I don't know. But there's like a shared secret that we go around the corner to talk, I guess. Install shots. And I'm just going to end the image of the recent ones I've made of Venus again in last month of we went around town and just started taking photos in supermarkets and clubs and um, uh, what else did we go like a swing pool, uh, all sorts of places, but yeah, so basically I, I think uh, what I'm interested in is also how like time changes and how it is important to keep the same subjects around me and that kind of becomes part of my practice I guess so I'm so nervous <laughs> um and that's my last slide so we can start doing things Henry <laughs> thank you Tom it's uh <clears throat> we I feel that the uh it's it was great to hear like uh, to to hear more about sort of how you approach the subjects and then also uh, how I guess in uh, you also play at the role of uh, can you hear me sorry I have a very <laughs> low <laughs> voice like a tone today for some reason I don't know Maybe yeah, clear um, and uh, uh, yeah so I was gonna say the um, uh, also like an observer, but also their, uh, their uh, photographs where you kind of insert yourself as part of the, the, the work. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, 
I guess we can green. Sunil, are you there? <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Hi. Thanks, Tom. That was great. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. And I just found your card. So we we met in. The, oh yeah, we, we met. In, to... We met in person somewhere some time ago. It was a uh, you had the show in the Vancouver Gallery and uh through my our friend uh, stephanie booking for she um uh -huh. she did this queer library and i was there to talk about your work um uh, and then okay. i guess she connected us and you came by first to you visit i think which is uh, yeah okay. <laughs> which made me less nervous yeah. having this talk but at the same time uh, i'm less nervous <laughs> oh okay yeah. well that must have been when there was the indian performing yeah. Was that the show? Yeah. That was the show, yeah. Thing. Yeah. In 2019, I believe. Yeah. 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 yeah the um I think that uh I think what intrigued me uh, after looking at your uh uh hearing your uh both of your talks is that there is um uh there are uh a lot of these very uh, these like human interactions and kind of experience that are embedded uh in both of your works and i i'm also i'm pretty i'm very drawn to um this type of um uh, this is a close uh close observation and also um feature of you know uh uh, humans uh, interacting with one another and then there seem to be this um, and I really enjoy this there seems to be this idea of um, this um, community that are ever present in these works I was wondering if you could share both of you can share a little bit about sort of how um, uh, because a lot of the subjects let's say in your works and then they are uh, I would say part of the community and it's sort of how how have uh, sort of that play then uh, has an impact on your practices? Um, I think that um, uh, both of you uh, uh, find, in a way, find a lot of uh, uh, recognition and also understanding in the people around you and then um, in the community. So I kind of, uh, if you can speak a little bit more about that that'd be fantastic. Sure. Uh, do you, Tom? Do you want to go first? Uh, oh no, I was I was maybe just gonna make a comment about like Christopher Street and how like yeah. that is so interesting to see now versus it's cruising then and cruising now, where it, it's you're able to actually study all these like gestures and all these like the people what people are wearing all the codes that they're suggesting with their physical appearances um but uh sorry what was the question <laughs> oh well i'll try to connect the two things together yeah. so for me uh was uh, uh before the internet so basically one had to go out to yeah. meet other people. So common experience everywhere in the world that I've been to is that most gay people start out thinking, oh, uh, I'm five years old. I must be the only homosexual in the world. And it's not until they meet another one somehow miraculously that they begin to think, well, there's at least another one or maybe there's enough five more or something. And so uh, as you grow older, uh, all of us then begin to seek out these, what you might call cruising grounds. So like a physical space somewhere uh, that you can be sure to meet other people like yourself and I'm choosing my words very carefully because uh, uh, in countries like in Asia and in India anyway, and uh, possibly in China and other parts of Asia, uh, where there are no bars or there were no bars or anything, uh, it was very, you met outside. And because everybody lived at home and extended families, 
the sex happened outside. So the outside was really important. Uh, and, uh, and so aside from, so your initial motivation might have been, I'm going to go down to the local K park and jerk off with somebody behind a tree. You know, that might be your initial gratification motivation. Uh, but over a period of time, you begin to realize that, uh, notice other, the other people. Uh, and I think those other people slowly but surely take shape as your community. They become the people who warn you about danger from police, from rent boys, from being attacked. They become the people uh, that you might just say hi to from a distance. You may not want to shag them, but you recognize that that guy over there is, is like you, you know, uh, and so on. Uh, and so basically, uh, for me, that that's the seed of starting to have a gay community. And that has worked for many people that I've met, certainly in Asia, and certainly in, uh, in some, some kinds of experiences that we've had over here in London and in New York, and, and definitely in Montreal. Because as I said, you know, there were half a dozen bars in gay bars in Mont downtown Montreal, and the same 200 people went to them every weekend. Uh, and you may not have slept or spoken to all of them, but you certainly knew to look at like who these people were. And then if you saw them in Eaton's or the Bay, you said, oh yeah, that's the guy from, you know, you know what I mean? And they kind of become your uh, insider people in a way, uh, kind of, that's the community. And then you feel what, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the person who said it first, that. It's this idea of community of belonging. You get a sense of belonging. Uh, I think it was Leela Gandhi, the person who teaches it, at, uh, Brown maybe, uh, who said that. But uh, so I think this is quite uh, a global thing that you need to find your communities of belonging. Uh, and this happens physically, which brings me to Christopher Street. So I think Christopher Street, was quite unique in 76 because people weren't just cruising, people were celebrating. You have to mm -hmm. remember that a lot of those people came from small town America. They were escaping horrific oppression, coming to Manhattan to find a place that, like a fabled fantasy place where they could just be themselves. To be free, kind of, yeah. Yeah, this is like three o'clock in the afternoon. You don't necessarily going to have a get a blow job right that minute, but you just want to be out amongst your people and you want to look like yourself, look your best kind of, and look attractive. And uh, it was kind of celebratory. Yeah, I, it's what I remember. Uh, it's a phenomena that was a little bit crushed by AIDS, but uh, this public display of here we are out and proud, never seen it like that after or before. It's not necessarily that was quite looking, unique. Yeah. It's not necessarily always looking for sex. It's always just looking for like familiar and also like like you said, where you where we belong kind of thing. Like looking yeah, for people that are looking. You, also, you know, so uh, aside from streets like that, uh, everywhere else it happens, you know, we meet in darkness, as you were saying, in dark rooms. Mm -hmm. and in the middle of the night and stuff like that. So it was just extraordinary to see hundreds of these gay men in the middle of the day. I was blown away by it. I was only 23. I thought, oh my God, there really are too many men and not enough time. Like the song says, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to have <laughs> sex with all of them, even if you tried. There's too so, many men. <laughs> too many men, honestly, so, yeah. Like, uh, it's kind of interesting because like making an image of them is almost not, not enough, but like, the next best thing, yeah. The next I best thing. Snap, all, so those are all the people that I fancied. So all those pictures are people that I would have had sex with, but I didn't have the time, or they didn't have the time, or but I could I could walk up to people and take pictures, and it was not uh, people weren't put off by it, you know. Mostly, I can't remember anybody saying, "Oh no," or "Go away," yeah. or something. I think that's something. A lot of these things have now changed, of course, partly through the internet. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. With, 
with like gay lingos online now that it's a different language to speak on on the apps and everything which is kind of weird to navigate yeah. here in Taiwan again because um, knowing how to talk not knowing how to talk in Rhino but understanding the Grind yeah. language back in Canada yeah. it doesn't really translate the same here that's true that is obviously same. interesting yeah so this is in so what do you it's in Chinese or in English when you the, the language you're communicating on Grinder in Taiwan um half half kind of because it, it would um, be my like I could write in Chinese but it wouldn't translate the same as how mm -hmm. I want to meet in English if that makes sense yeah and I also know like I also vaguely saw like you, the Christopher Street stuff was related to how Man Lang was just the fashion company or oh, something yeah. that they <laughs> but I was wondering how that was how did that work oh that was a commercial idea so uh, so the 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 designer at Helmut Lang really liked the book of Christopher Street, and uh, it inspired his the collection for the following year. And so uh, they then asked me to come and take photographs of his new collection uh, back on Christopher Street, which incredibly looks much the same. You know, it it must be under some preservation order or something because the streets are pretty much the same. A lot of the same things are still there, and uh, except that I don't do fashion, you know. But so, but then they said, "Would I think about it?" And then uh, they they said quite a lot of money, more money than I've ever seen before. I thought, okay, <laughs> I'll try it. <laughs> so, but it was quite terrifying. So, you know, I did Christopher Street over several weeks in the autumn when the weather was right and everything and i was alone right and i'm engaging mm -hmm. with complete strangers so it's like i come to this job this has now become a job and it all has to happen in one day they yeah. can't show me the clothes the clothes don't arrive you know until the last minute they can't show me the people they don't hire the models till the last minute and then I just turn up at 8 a.m. for the shoot and uh, I'll find like, like there's 50 people there doing things. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was, yeah. You know, there were like models and makeup and whatnot and hair and producers and whatnot. And, uh, and it's in February in Manhattan. Terrible. Hardly any light. Yeah. A little bit of light rain. I'm thinking, you know, what are the two going on about anyway? And then so when we actually do the shoots, I have to then find the locations as we go along. It was pretty intense and they have some 20 odd outfits and all this. And so, and uh, I'm not used to this. I'm, suddenly I'm tethered, you know, I'm attached yeah. to some computer. And so there's a whole bunch of people, you know, the people who give the money and the designers and everything, all looking at, as I'm taking the pictures, they're looking on the screen. So I'm feeling very like, Watched, uh, kind of, yeah, <laughs> what, yeah, totally. Like every frame is seen, kind of thing. Uh, and I'm like, but it was too hectic for me to worry about, you know. So first, I thought this is very intimidating. People having the client look at the picture as you're taking it, you know, yeah. that never happens normally. Normally, no. especially in, in my analog world history, you know, you took the pictures. Everybody waited for a week for the film to get <laughs> processed. You know, <laughs> nobody knew what you <laughs> took right then so, instantly yeah yeah and then they wanted to, to process all the pictures and make the prints make prints like the same weekend so we stayed up all night and got 22 pictures out of i don't know three thousand frames and some lab people had to stay up all night to make big prints of this and then incredibly on monday instead of when i arrived at the, the store they'd removed all the clothes there were no clothes. Oh. Uh, they framed up these pictures and they had a photo show of their clothes and uh, and my old pictures, which they borrowed from my gallery. And they had mm -hmm. a photography show. So for New York Fashion Week, Helmut Lang just had a photo show, no clothes. Oh. Uh, so that was, yeah, quite interesting. That's how kind of how it happened. 
Um, and I've like since realized that, uh, yeah. yeah, that there's, uh, since then, uh, because my focus is often is on documentary, that the fashion people are looking at documentary for inspiration. So uh, other people have, the smaller things have come and go around that. Uh, but I was, uh, before we lose the community, so uh, I felt one of the things we had in common that Henry was maybe trying to allude to, he said, you shoot people you know mostly, and, and I mostly shoot people I know as well, historically. Mm -hmm. Most people in my pictures are people I, I know somehow uh, uh, to some degree. They're, aside from the street pictures like Christopher Street, uh, mm -hmm. that's why doing the Helmut Lang was a bit weird because these were people who were just available for an hour, you know? Yeah. So, uh, which there's became no a bit light. tricky. Uh, yeah, the, so between us, it was, uh, all I could do was direct, do some little rudimentary direction, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely a so different it, mode of working. <laughs> yeah. Although what was interesting was that what they did do was keep to the spirit of it in the sense that I've always been interested in the subject being gay so that we then have a record uh, of gay men or women or whatever uh, for the future. Because I remember I grew up with no record, you know, there was nothing to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was never saw gay Asian ever, you know, anywhere. Uh, either in art history or down at the bar or in any gay magazine or anything. Uh, so it was important that we made pictures uh, of ourselves and our friends to, you know, to give them a kind of presence. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that helps uh, this community building, you know, to see others, uh, familiar faces, let's say. Uh, it definitely and, helps. Uh, and, it, it's, and it helps like globally now as well, just, just not like within our little Oh, no, definitely. Country. Yeah. Yeah. I do a bit of teaching in here in London. And it's a, as you may know, there's a lot of Asian students here now, uh, art students, you know mainly from East Asia, mainland China and uh, uh, South Korea and things. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they're very informative. You know, I've had young Chinese women come out in their essay, you know, because wow. they can't say it in class. You know, they because there's so many sometimes, then they're a little nervous about what they can say in front of the other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but this year's batch, my partner has also started to teach in his class. Three of the girls just came out straight out, you know, so they, they also changed. So the new lot, they're more secure. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and one of my students was a drag king from Guangzhou. Oh, wow. Uh, who dresses up in Peking opera style, like really dresses up. <laughs> so yeah, but she, she used to perform uh, the vagina monologues in Guangzhou and oh. she kept moving. So by the time the authorities heard about it, she'd have finished and moved to another place. So they could never catch her, catch in, her. The act, sort of, in the act. Uh, so yeah, so then, uh, so that was quite interesting to, to meet then through her, like some people, because I went to uh, to Guangzhou in a local photo festival and uh, met some people through her. Nice, thanks. But I think what is happening is that uh, these kind of meetings of, of you and me speaking here are rare. So one of the issues in the 80s, this is one of my 80s issues is used to be that places like London and New York and Paris remain like the center because we meet through them. Mm -hmm. We don't meet directly. No, it's like, a, that's how you connect, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we have to do more of this uh, direct thing. Uh, 
I think you'll find people interested in what you're saying in South Asia as well as here, obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, everybody, sense... even when I was in India, I felt like people were wanting to have shows, do all this and whatnot in the West. I mean, there's a little more cognition now, of the South and other places, but it's it's slow to get off the ground. Mm -hmm. because the, the commercial galleries are starting have started last year to have a south network let's see how it goes some events okay. happen talks happen and so on uh, that'll be nice to like connect all, to, all of that together yeah because there are a lot of issues in common all of us have these great leaders who want to go back to some very glamorous classical past that we once had <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, how to resist them is something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for speaking about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying this more uh, deep chats and I look at some of these things. But actually, I have a question that's kind of relevant to what you're saying is kind of on the opposite side of it uh -huh. which is, um, I wonder for example uh, Sunil when you're in the UK in the States um, in Canada and then Tom uh, when you're in Canada so I wonder if you can speak about sort of like how you navigate uh, as um, a racialized queer person uh, mm -hmm. Because I do think that uh, there is this kind of prevalent kind of like, oh, solidarity and then uh, advocacy for gay rights. But then uh, a lot of narratives are pre predominantly um, white. And then there are uh, non-white bodies that are not necessarily always included in the conversations. And also there are uh, these uh, preferences for different um ethnicities let's say when uh, in, in the um the queer community so i wonder if you can speak a little bit about that mm -hmm. because i feel that almost sometimes um we like to think it as a utopia is that everybody love each other and then um rise for everybody but that might <laughs> not necessarily be the case so i kind of wonder sort of how you navigate through that and also um yeah, yeah, maybe that's just a kickstart. <laughs> okay, well, so when I first, I arrived in 1969, uh, the Stonewall, uh, into Montreal, which was in the midst of a big Anglo-French, you know, blow up thing. There was FLQ was active and all that. So it's something I wasn't aware of until I got there that the French and English were having a big standoff, you know, and the Parti Québécois was on the rise. And I realized that as a, coming from India, I had nothing to offer them. You know, they were completely uninterested in me. So I did a year of high school. I went to Montreal High for what it's for one year. And the kids in my class, I don't think even knew where India was on the map. It was like year zero. So my whole life before I came to Canada was meaningless. I could offer them nothing. So I had to start from scratch and I had to forget about India. And I was very lucky that I was gay because the next year I discovered gay liberation. That was very cool. Next thing I knew I was gay and then everybody was interested. So uh, I took on this, let's say a kind of non-racialized gay identity because there was zero interest in the race. Uh, also, uh, there were no other South Asians that I could, who, who were apparently gay or willing to be out so it was pointless. Uh, it never occurred to me that we're even a group because there was nobody to be a group with. All I could see were like 
all these white people who were, but except Montreal was very ethnically diverse in its whiteness. Mm. So they were, my high school was very divided between Greeks, Italians, blah, 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 and so on. Um, and of course, the outside, because Montreal had four school boards, right? So they had French, English, Catholic, and Protestant. I was in the English Protestant one, thanks to my mother who was Protestant. Um, so on the streets, there was a different matter. You know, everybody spoke French. It was a whole other thing. So, uh, so for me, those early politics, as you saw in that first picture of mine, was to then kind of identify or uh, figure out what this working class French position was about how they had been uh, colonized and taken over by the British and the Anglos. Uh, so I was, my initial identifying sympathies or whatever lay with, uh, with the Francophone cause in Quebec because of where I was. And uh, so then, but Kay McGill, the activist student group that I joined because it was at McGill, inevitably was English speaking. So Gay McGill immediately then had a political problem. It was English speaking in a Francophone province. Uh, so I feel in Canada, those Francophone, Anglophone, those issues, have, they still haven't gone away. Whenever I go back, it's still happening. Mm -hmm. I was just there this summer. It was still in the, they were still going on about it. So it's like this overriding thing doesn't matter if you're Indian or not, this Anglophone, Francophone thing is much larger and that just subsumes everything. Uh, so within that, uh, personally, I found the Francophones more just friendly as people, even though I didn't speak the language very well, I found the Anglos incredibly cold, like the Brits are, you know, like and reserved and uh, uh, unfriendly, let's put, put it that way. Uh, and so we, we looked at Toronto with a certain kind of horror. That was the home of those horrible Anglophones. And when you went there, you know, you all your prejudices about how nasty they were was proved to you. Uh, and anyway, they had a terrible culture, you know, they used to, uh, they used to all go to bed at 10, all their bars closed at 10.30 or so. Mm. And everybody was saving to get married and have a mortgage. Unlike Montreal, but everybody spent their money on clothes and going out <laughs> and never going <laughs> home. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, on the other hand, Toronto was home of body politic, you know, back in the day. So, uh, so there was that kind of politics, but it was kind of very Anglophone and we weren't sure if we had any room in there. Uh, so that's the point at which I left. And so when I go back periodically, uh, those are the spaces that I kind of inhabit. Uh, and uh, uh, just through friendship networks, so I had accidentally my my parents passed away. They were my reason to go to Montreal and my professional life moved to Toronto because the galleries there and so on. And so uh, my gay connections also somewhat moved because all the people all moved west and elsewhere. Uh, uh, historically, the people I see if I go now uh, to Toronto are, uh, in fact, Richard Fung and his partner, Tim, who was, mm. uh, um, because, and their home is always a center for people dropping by, people having discussion with politics, blah, 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 and so on, yeah. And so they're very sensitive to, obviously, you know, to uh, uh, race, et cetera, and politics and Asians and, uh, it's, it's in Toronto where I've seen, uh, I get more of a social sense anyway of Asians, both East Asians and South Asians, and they're kind of very rare occasionally. 
place in which I see actually that coupled um, between the two groups, which I don't see so readily elsewhere, certainly not here in London, uh, where everybody seems to have a white partner. I mean, every Asian that I met, whether the East Asian or South Asian, seems to have a white husband. Uh, uh, so as you're saying, you know, that we're a kind of uh, menu choice, aren't we? So it used to be by food. I don't know if that's still mm -hmm. the case. By no, because there, there used to be, there were rice queens and then there were oh, curry yeah. queens. And then, uh, then if it was the other way around, then you would be called a potato queen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I had an artist friend from Hong Kong called Hiram Cho, whose work I used to show here. He made some great work about this, uh, about white bread and sandwiches and all this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah. that's true. We've been reduced to... Uh, uh, Certainly, in the popular gay press, I guess I don't know what to call it, but uh, in in London for years, you know, they would you go when you went out on the scene, you could pick up these gay magazines, right? And they used to have centerfolds and things. I probably still do, uh, uh, and you never see anything Asian in there. No, no. no. You might see something black. They have big dicks, right? Yeah, it's better. So <laughs> that, that stereotype. So uh, yeah, uh, and you may see East Asians sometimes because they're so smooth and uh, and lovely, pristine, and, or uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and milky. And, but we never see South Asians. You know, dark, hairy fellows with not big dicks. Forget it. Never see them. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, we have to make say, our own magazine. Let's make our own magazine. <laughs> Absolutely, there's more of us anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say there's this uh, also kind of the fetishization of uh, certain uh, bodies uh, in the the queer communities, and I kind of because to me it's like um, I I think that. Uh, perhaps uh, in Tom's work, there was this kind of reversed lens uh, in a way. And then also um, maybe the same in Sunil's work as well. So I, I, I just think that these, um, uh, it's really true that with this kind of like your identity is kind of reduced to a certain, like to some kind of, um, preference or uh, I don't know certain traits of you and or your race and then you are brought into brought on the uh, sort of into conversations so yeah I'm kind of interested in like maybe sort of in uh, both of your contacts like it's like are these do you see these are some of the conversations that are being had in terms of like what what uh, is are things changing are people being more open or yeah kind of curious to see if you have any observations well um well i'm i was really uh, very uh, happy to see the mirror work that tom was showing us where you see him so you see that the person making the work is asian uh uh, to make that very explicit, that's I think that was quite interesting strategy. Because uh, some some uh, people uh, think forget that I'm Asian, and I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna put myself in there. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's kind of like yeah. what Richard Fong did with the like, the porno videos where he. Oh, there were marvelous his... Chinese character that's called. I still have that tape. <laughs> I yeah, I, I I came across it this year, and I was like, this is amazing. Oh, okay. Like, Did well, it show it to you with Emily Carr? It was part of the uh, movie screening that was part of the Libby Leshko um, programming. Okay. That makes sense. But they should so be they... teaching it to you. Yeah. They should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's no, how that's I was... true. 
Yeah, that's how I was kind of thinking about it. Well, I might as well. I, it's important to just then put myself in there to see. Personally, I was just was just curious to see what I was doing. But then when you know how when you like take a photo, you're like, don't know what's going to happen. But then when you yeah. get the result, you're like, oh, this is this is actually really interesting kind of thing. Well, I feel like there have been some correlations between, say, Canada and the UK because we all live in a similar English speaking art education funded, partly funded and with arts councils involved and all of that and policy documents and so on and juries and I've sat on juries in England and I have sat on them at the Canada Council so I could see that it's quite not too unlike each other. Uh, of course, Canada Council has tons more money, by the way, you're much better off. The poor Brits have no money at all. Uh, however, uh, I think what's uh, changing is that uh, uh, what we used to call black arts here, British black arts, has been overtaken by American black lately. It's, and that's accelerated with, with Black Lives Matter to the extent that everything uh, that was under the wider umbrella of post-colonialism has become color, has become black as in color. Uh, and I think we need to talk about it. It's not very popular. No one wants to talk about it because over here we've had a coalition for so long. Uh, and uh, but I'm seeing a lot of evidence that of history is being rewritten, and uh, uh, so when people say black now, they mean Afro. Everything is Afro. Every art gallery, every museum has to have a big Afro show. You don't want to be boxed in like that because then it doesn't. No, really because then you, you, you and me, we have where's our space? You know. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be uh, structurally. There needs to be sort of this recognition of specific, specific. So, sorry, long yeah, word. Specific. Specific, no, no, yeah. Uh, cities of um, uh, of different uh, uh, groups and uh, yeah. communities. I just, I think that it's really, um, it's it's uh, it's not. It's very reductive if uh, everything was kind of like boxed. Uh, then, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. that's what the US is like. The US always has been like apartheid. You know, when we went there in the 80s to find like minded people, what we found that the autograph was a multi racial organization, always has been Afro and Asian. But we go to New York or somewhere, and it's all like African American Museum here, Latin American Museum there, Chinese American Museum somewhere else. You know, it's all like everybody has their own separate little thing. Uh, and so, uh, and it's like in pitch battle and kind of also in in league with with the white mainstream, but not with each other. Again, it's the same problem that everybody's looking to the to the uh, former white masters in a way. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I think that's. Uh, when we started, and Henry, you elaborated to a much greater degree than I normally hear about the need to state where you are in Vancouver on unceded indigenous territory and all. Uh, I mean, there's a history that had a much more terrible, in a sense, because they don't, they're hardly around now in that sense. Uh, but, you know, at present, uh, or very limited presence. Uh, so I, you know, we want to hear more about that and those people. You know, what art are they making now? You know, also, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we need to like have more coming together. We, I mean, we could at least try it with Asia. Uh, yeah, I think that definitely a more even distribution of resources for uh, all the disadvantaged groups would be uh, would would be a, a better uh, approach. Definitely, it's just uh, it's uh, very challenging when you know uh, uh, these uh, communities and individuals they don't have uh, uh, enough resources to really. Uh, 
the resources to support their practices and also insert their uh, full agencies in them. So it's it's I think that uh, these days we uh, it's it's kind of these like resources. Uh, distribution, redistribution, redistribution. So I think that it's, um, that's uh, crucial uh, for sure. And then, uh, and then for, I, I would say that for example, uh, 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 Sunil and Tom, I think that you, you are, for your work, you have making a lot of space for um, Asian subjectivities and also uh, uh, Asian queer subjectivities um, in, in, uh, in our, discourse. So I think that's very important. And definitely we need, uh, I, I like, I think that uh, initially when I also programmed this talk and what I thought about was this, there's this kind of intergenerational uh, aspect uh, that it's super important because there, this work does continue being done, uh, sorry, continuously being done. So I, uh, I really uh, uh, appreciate that. Tom, do you, did you feel like you wanted to say something, or, or did I interrupt? No, 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 no. I was, I was just like fixing my hair. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, perhaps uh, we still have a little bit of time. I wonder if anyone from the audience might have questions. Um, and um, um, and uh, before that, I do have a question. It's like, what are you two working on? Uh, what's coming up? <laughs> Maybe you can uh, share a little bit. Uh... Um, I'm, I'm like I said, I, I am right now back in Taiwan, so I'm trying to, I guess, like renavigate what how I'm seeing and visiting my grandmother. I guess so, I'm taking more portraits of her. So there's been four sessions throughout every time I've been visiting. Um, and I guess this repetition of like coming back home, how much has changed is is kind of interesting to me, I guess. So I'm I'm working on some images here to put a show on in Vancouver, kind of to bridge the two together of the two places I was brought up. Yeah. And so far, how do you do you, have you find any sort of parallels and what are I guess you it just started. Exploring. Like yeah, I just started, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm started. So I'm starting to like get familiar with this place again, and it's 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 both like familiar and it's both familiar and unfamiliar, which is also very interesting to be in the position of because I guess so much things have changed, but so much things still remind me of how things used to be. That makes my dad just got out. <laughs> that's what yeah, I'm kind of working on right now. Uh, and me, I'm uh, I'm uh, still. We just that book that the last book it needs launching properly, so I'm doing the rounds about that, and then trying to plan the next couple of ones which will hopefully be the some of the series we the last series we saw the Indian portraits and hopefully the Montreal kind of pictures oh do you've got it all right. I got it okay. <laughs> that was, that was oh, that's amazing we just just oh really okay you got it in yeah. Taiwan no I I found it in uh, Vancouver and I brought it back oh I'm right okay yeah oh uh, I mean, I'll try to look for it in Taiwan, but I'll see. I'll oh, try. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, the proposal has come to us, uh, two of us here, my partner and I, about doing something again that's more joint. So we might do that. Uh, it's in a curious idea, which is to uh, literally do something uh, together on uh, using analog film. But uh, uh, if that works out, we're going to meet the people, then hopefully it'll happen sometime next year. Uh, yeah. So there's always uh, lots of things to to do. And then I'm trying to, the other thing I'm just trying to explore more is uh, working in Europe, which is something I've pretty much ignored for a very long time. But I think ever since Brexit, I felt more sympathetic to the idea 
So I'm getting involved with people in Rome in a gallery and I'm trying to create a situation where I can spend more time next year uh, making work uh, in, in Rome specifically and in Italy in general. Uh, what I don't know, are we going to go and spend some time and see what happens? Thank you. Thank you for the dance. Do we have any questions? <laughs> uh, if not, I will say that uh, it's been a great pleasure to hearing uh, both of you speak. I think this is uh, such a wonderful conversation and it's so great to see uh, you introducing your work. Um, and Sunil, I look forward to reading the book when it's completed. Uh, I am uh, I'm thrilled to hear about it and also uh, definitely Tom when you're back in Vancouver I'd love to see the, the show and um, uh, yeah okay yeah great well hopefully I'll be able to when I next time I come visit I'll look you up for sure yeah and now we have a whatsapp group so we can <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah, yes <it's> true. <laughs> we should keep that through running up and then yeah, we, can we should yeah we should. let's keep a dialogue going yeah. yeah uh also thank you to everyone who came today uh thank you so much for being with us uh and also my colleague diana kim uh in the background to uh to help and maintain the technicality and stuff so uh thank you everyone uh, I wish you, Thank you. Wherever you are, I wish you have a nice afternoon and then for Sunil, uh, uh, good night and thanks again, Henry. And thanks a lot, Tom. It's great to Thank hear you. you speak and to see your work properly. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Dan. Talk soon. Okay. Oh, Talk soon. <laughs> good night. Bye, good night. everyone. Good, good night. night. Good night. <laughs>